we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 235 years ago, at 6th and Market, everybody else in the country, they say, in Philadelphia. <laughs> I love the fact that we're in Philadelphia and it was at 6th and Market. We as a nation agreed to that. It was before the nation even existed. It was an idea, an agreement. Really powerful. That is an intentional statement, and that has continued to unfold over the last 235 years, sometimes with more joy and obvious good than at others. See the current political situation, scratch your head and say, is this what they had in mind? <laughs> and yes. Because when you look at that, it seems as though the big word is happiness. Because that's what it ends on. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you'll notice that Thomas Jefferson did not say in the Declaration of Independence that we have a right to happiness. Now Thomas Jefferson, awesome good writer. Quite a badass. I think I've mentioned before that Thomas Jefferson, when somebody asked about his view of Christianity, <clears throat> in order to explain it, took the New Testament, cut it up with a razor blade, and put the 18 pages of relevant stuff, most of which Jesus was quoted directly to have said, together in an order that made sense to him, and got rid of the rest. He says, this is the part that makes a difference. I also just found out last week that he was the first person in recorded history to use the word shag to mean what you think the word shag means. <laughs> so, Thomas Jefferson, pretty cool. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He did not say we have a right to happiness. He said we have a right to pursue happiness. So whatever it is that we think is going to bring happiness into our lives, we're free to do that. We have the liberty to do that. We have the freedom to do that, the independence to pursue our happiness. Because <clears throat> the question, and it's really great that it's phrased that way, because the question that comes up is if you have a right to happiness, what's the next thing that's gonna happen? Somebody's gonna tell you what's gonna make you happy. Now, I have been in relationships, and I know other people who have been in relationships where somebody else will tell them what will make them happy. <laughs> and they're not necessarily always right. Sometimes they're incorrect. That choice of what's going to make me happy not only is my choice to make, not only is that choice your choice to make, but you are free to change your mind at any time. You can have something in your 20s that you think is going to make you happy and by the time you get into your 40s or 50s, it doesn't matter anymore. And that doesn't make you wrong when you were 20. What it makes you instead is 20, and that's okay. Because we go through that process and we are free to create the life that we're choosing. We have that liberty to pursue happiness in whatever form it's gonna be taking. That's the part that I wanna be talking about today. Is what does that freedom look like? What does that liberty to make those choices look like for us? Because we're not free to just do anything. We have prisons for people who did stuff that it turns out the rest of us didn't really think was the right thing to be doing. We have agreements as a society that we've made about how we're going to behave, how we're going to organize ourselves, how we're going to interact with each other. So those are the norms of society, those are the rules, those are the laws. So we have to stay within those confines. Do I have to obey the law? Nope. I am free to make my choices. I can obey the law, I cannot obey the law. Laws about stealing stuff, I obey. Not because there's a law, just because I'm not okay with stealing stuff. Laws about speed limits, I'm a little more flexible. <laughs> <laughs> and when I do that, I have to acknowledge that I am a free individual 
making my own choices, deciding how it is that I want to engage with the world around me, and I'm also accountable for those choices. So in New Thought Philadelphia, we have the, the two balancing notions of accountability and authority. Authority means that we can do whatever we want. We have the authority to take whatever steps and go through whatever activities we want to in our lives. And we can do that. Each one of us is free to make our own choices, just like it said right there in the Declaration of Independence. And whatever the consequences or the results of those choices are, we're accountable for them. Now, I also know a lot of people who like to duck the accountability part. Something happens, something that they were directly involved in, and they get called on it, and there's a story, well, my dog ate my homework, or my mom made me do it, or there was a storm, or this happened, or that happened, or whatever the situation and the circumstance was. Whatever the reason that that uncomfortable situation came about, that's what they want to talk about. And those are probably very true. Those things all happen. Those reasons all happen. But as our friend Joni Carley, who is a business consultant, likes to say, oh, yeah, reasons. Reasons will kill you. <laughs> and she does it a little flippantly, but if we're so focused on the reason why something isn't going the way it's supposed to be going, or the reason that we disappointed somebody or caused a difficult situation, we've missed the point. We're not taking accountability for what it is that we've created. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the people who are always talking about the outside forces that made them do something that, that hurt your feelings, eventually it becomes too much of a problem to continue dealing with them. And you either stop the relationship or the relationship becomes all about how they do that. Mm. Yeah. So there's, a, uh, <clears throat> there's another um, old-fashioned device. Uh, actually, it's newfangled as well, but it's been around for a while, called the weather vane. See the weather vane? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's up on the top and it just <coughs> points to the direction that the wind is coming from. And it will point directly to the wind. But you know what happens with a weather vane? It never points to itself. It never says, I'm causing the disturbance, I'm causing the breeze, I'm <coughs> causing this disruption. And that's the difference between people and weather vanes. When we have somebody who's doing that weather vane thing, you say, I'm in a relationship with you and something's happened and it's made me unhappy and they go and they start pointing at all the things around them without pointing at themselves. That gets really tiresome. Has anybody noticed that happening? Mm -hmm. Has anybody else had a relationship with somebody where they continuously weather vane mm. when something's not going right? Yeah. And has anybody had the relationship with somebody where you say, this happened and it bothered me and they listen and they look at themselves and they say, oh, I dropped the ball on that. I didn't measure up. I didn't do what I wanted to do. And I'd like to, to make it up to you or make amends or reconnect or understand and learn from that process. They're willing to look at themselves. What's the next thing that happens after that? The relationship grows. Because now, instead of it just being about this challenge and being defensive and deflecting, there's an opportunity to use that as that motivation for growth for whatever's going to happen next. So we're always free to create whatever it is that we want to create next in our lives. And there's two pieces to it. There's the authority that we have. Author. What a great word. It's author. That's what Thomas Jefferson was doing. He was authoring this new idea. He had the authority to make a new intention and state something that he wanted to bring into experience. And you have that too in your life, on the little stuff and on the big stuff. When somebody says, do you want to meet me for coffee, and you don't, you can say, I'll try, <laughs> which means no, <laughs> but it's not supposed to sound like it's no, or we'll see, which is I'll tell you later, or I'll disappoint you later. <laughs> Or you could say, no, I need to take care of myself during that time and that's not going to work for me, which opens the door for something else. Like, oh, do we have a different relationship than I thought we were having? Or do we want to have coffee a different day that's gonna, where we're going to be able to fit it together? 
being honest about that, being accountable for what your answer is, it's really important because that can be transformative. So this words thing, this is really important. I found that this is, uh, you know, I put my word into the law. The law says yes, and I am thereby and therefore able to create some new experience. And then I'm accountable for whatever it is that happened. If I say I want something and it turns out that's not what I wanted and that's what I get, then I have to say, oh, that wasn't what I meant. This didn't go quite as well as I wanted it to go. And we get to set a new intention. Affirmation card last week. Emma Curtis Hopkins, that great quote, this too is good, this too is God, this too is for me now, and I demand to see the blessing in it. I demand to see the blessing in it. That's because whatever word we spoke before, whatever intention we set, whether it was conscious or subconscious or unconscious, that's what's showing up in our lives. And I don't like it. <laughs> but the good that shows up in there is that whatever's in my life, if I'm creating it, then as soon as I notice that I'm creating something that I don't like, I am free to choose something different. Liberty. You are all always free to choose something different. We're all free to choose something different. To allow those pieces to fit together in a new way. There's two different views of the founding documents in this country. One is that we need to take them literally. And the other is we need to take the meaning of what they meant and build upon it for the changing times. I'm not sure that 235 years ago they didn't think about smartphones and if that would change anything. But to imagine that we're going to have those sorts of changes in our technology, the way to communicate, the way that we inter interact with each other, and all of the other changes that have happened in 235 years, and think that those same set of words, without modification, can continue to apply forever and ever, might be a little bit short-sighted. Because there's a difference when you're having a conversation with somebody between what did you say and what did you mean. What did you say, assuming that I actually heard it correctly, <laughs> it'd be, what did you say? But when the question is, what did you say, then like, we're going to draw the line and see whether I agree with your words or not. What did you mean is much more, this is what I heard. Is that true? Did I get the correct message? Is what I heard you say and what you wanted to be conveying to me the same thing? And that's the invitation for the relationship to grow. Oh, well, yeah, that's what I said, but that, no, I didn't mean it that way. I'm thinking of three examples that happened this morning. I'm not going to talk about any of them. <laughs> Had to do with washing your hair. Um, <clears throat> I was, I'm, I'm not, no, I'm just, okay, let's we'll just continue. <laughs> There's always that invitation to go deeper, to be more connected, to be open enough to allow more love to come into the situation. Some people are really good at it. Some people avoid it like a plague. Some people, when they're given the opportunity to look at what it was that they said and are challenged on what they meant, start pointing at stuff out here. I said this because of this. I said this because of that. They're not looking at what it was that was in my actions that caused that reaction from somebody else. And one of my pet peeves, and this is a little bit of a detour, but this is something that I'm trying to figure out how to talk about, is what I call spiritual assault. <clears throat> and if you want to know what I'm talking about, and the reason it's, it's difficult to explain is because you have to give an example, and by giving an example, I'm doing it, and I don't like to do that. Um, <laughs> but a perfect example would be the medical expert being interviewed on TV or on the radio where they're being talk they're talking about some malady some terminal illness and they'll say well when you have and they'll name the illness then you're going to experience then then you have this and you have this and you have this 
and your arms do this and your legs do this and they go through this whole explanation of what they think they're talking about the illness but because they're using the second person and they're saying you they're taking their word and they're multiplying it by the entire audience so everybody's sitting there having basically this new I am statement thrown at them most powerful statement in the world I am powerful I am lovable I am great second most powerful is you are lovable you are wonderful you are great and if I change that to you are in this horrible situation with these horrible symptoms and this terrible thing going on in your life a lot of people just believe that that's the race consciousness that's the voodoo belief that's where somebody can cast a spell upon us and all we need to do is just be a little bit vulnerable and we take that and we believe it cold and flu season it's my favorite example Long about November, they start telling us that it's cold and flu season, so we're <laughs> going to need NyQuil, and we're going to need you know, Zyrtec, and we're going to all these other things that we're going to need because it's cold and flu season. But then it gets to be allergy season, and we need the same things. <laughs> and then it's after allergy season, it's before cold and flu season, and then there's summer colds. Got a hint for you. There's no such thing as flu season. The flu virus, the cold virus, doesn't know when it's in season or when it's out of season. It's just kind of there. It's kind of like the 23 bus. <laughs> if you need, to, if you, if you need to, to catch the 23 bus, then you go out, catch the 23 bus. I have never been on the 23 bus <laughs> because I have had no need to catch the 23 bus. In the same way, I have no need to catch a cold or flu. But with people convincing us that it's the season, that we're vulnerable, that this is going to happen, that we're susceptible, and we tie that together with being sick and tired of stuff and really wanting to take some time off from work and all the rest of those things, those can add up in our lives to an experience of cold and flu. By the way, anybody who's experienced a cold and flu, I am not minimizing your experience. <laughs> I have had a cold in my life. I've had the flu in my life. It is no fun. It's a real thing. It's not real because somebody says it's cold and flu season. There is some combination of events that has happened that has brought that into somebody's experience. And I'm using the third person when I talk about that. I'm not saying brought it into your experience because you don't have the cold or the flu. You're a divine and perfect expression of God's love right here and now and always. P.S. That's the antidote. <laughs> to remind yourself the truth of who you are in all those situations. And the authority and accountability part in that comes down to turn it off. If there's a person who is supposedly the authority on this topic who's standing there speaking second person about an illness to you, turn it off. You may want to hear how the story comes out. You might be intrigued about the information. Turn it off. You don't need to listen to somebody telling lies about you. Thank goodness I have a mute button on my TV because all of those pharmaceutical ads, <laughs> which are everywhere, if I had a fraction of those symptoms that they're telling me that I have, I'd be miserable. Thank goodness I'm as healthy as I am. Thank goodness you're as healthy as you are. There's some other really cool stuff in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. First of all, that is the most badass way to start a sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. How do you argue with that? No, we don't. They're not self-evident. <laughs> so, Jefferson got up way on top of the hill on that. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and we're not disagreeing with that because they are self-evident, that all men are created equal. And he used the term men because that's the language of the day. But that's not what he meant. He meant all people. And when he wrote men, he wanted it to mean all men, but it didn't because of the times that we were in. That we, we still at that point had people owning other people and that wasn't okay. And he knew it even though he was one of the people who owned slaves. But he went to the farthest edge with his authority to say this is not the world I'm living in. This is the world we're creating together. And by getting everybody else to agree and say yes, that's the opportunity to create something new. 
So as you celebrate the barbecue or the parade or the bike ride, if you're going to be heading from Valley Forge to Philadelphia with us this weekend, pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as you're creating that life of joy and happiness that you so richly deserve. And happy Independence Day.